Hi, this is Phil Reininger. I'm the president of the Global Cyber Alliance, and today we're talking with Peter W. Singer, the world-renowned thinker and strategist about cyber conflict and politics. Today we're talking in particular about two of his books, uh, Like War, published in 2018, and Burn In, a novel just published on May 26th, um, or I should say a novel just published on May 26th. Um, Peter, thank you for joining us. I oh, appreciate you having me on. Let's start with your new novel, Burn In. Um, we all have more technology in our lives than we ever thought possible. My TV is smarter than the Apollo capsule. Um, what do you do with those changes in your book? So Burn In is a uh, new kind of book. It's, um, as you note, it's a novel, uh, but it's smashed up with nonfiction. It's playing um, both sides at once. So the story is a techno thriller that follows a um, FBI agent's hunt for a new kind of terrorist. And for people in this audience, uh, in particular, a new kind of terrorist who's going after um, cybersecurity flaws that are both out there today, but also what looms just around the corner. But baked into the story are over 300 explanations and predictions along with the in-note reference to show, hey, this really is from the real world. So the idea of it is that you get entertained, you follow a, a vivid story, um, I'm biased, but I think really cool characters. But at the same time, you learn about everything from um, how does AI really work? What are the planned applications? What does it look like to be living in a world of internet of things? But also, what are the vulnerabilities that loom? What are the dilemmas that we're going to face, both cybersecurity, national security dilemmas, but also dilemmas in terms of business, politics, even on your home life? And uh, so through the book, you hopefully get entertained, but also you walk away from it a little bit smarter. Um, you know, I, there's a couple ways to think about it. One is um, no one ever said, man, um, I just really enjoyed this PowerPoint so much. Uh, you ought to take it on your next, you know, <laughs> beach vacation. Or um, man, this 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 um, academic white paper. Wow, it kept me up late at night. Uh, you know, every chapter I just couldn't put it down. I wanted to stay up late at night. They do that with novels, and that's both public all the way up to the most senior um, leaders in business and government. So this is the idea of it. The other, you know, parallel that we make is that um, I'm a parent. Uh, so I liken it to uh, sneaking fruit and veggies into a smoothie, uh, except, you know, in this case, the good stuff is, you know, learning about all these important issues. But hopefully, you know, you get just the my kids enjoy the taste of the smoothie. They don't, they don't know that I'm sneaking all that good stuff in there. And it's sort of the same uh, here with with Burn It. You know, as you talk about the book, Peter, uh, another analogy that comes to mind is it sounds like one of these futuristic tabletop exercises where there are injects and people play through what's happening. So it's somewhat fictional, it's projective, but it's all based on what people foresee um, as real capabilities and real possible responses in the near term. Absolutely, and um, I would add on that though, two uh, layers. One is sometimes a flaw in those, those exercises, and you and I participate in them, is um, they have what I call vaporware in it. Uh, they have, you know, something that is set off in the future and, oh, we might have that or maybe a bad guy could do X. Our rule is no vaporware. Uh, so when something happens, uh, whether it's a certain technology or a certain kind of breach, you can then, if you want, you don't have to, but you can go to the footnote and find, oh, here's the threat report where uh, it was shown. Here's where someone uh, actually did it, or um, here's where a hacker showed off at a, a you know, a DEF CON convention that this could be done. Um, the other part that's sometimes missing in that, uh, again, on the, the exercise side, um, is that we tend to come at it through our own lens, and have an idealized version of the world. And so by painting it within the context of a novel, you get to see it from different perspectives. So uh, you get to see what it experienced, what it seems like from the uh, perspective of the attacker, the defender, but oh, by the way, that defender, uh, they have all other identities. They might be um, a parent, they might be a spouse, uh, so you can see how the very same activities play out through the lens of 
uh, someone who's in law enforcement or someone who is in government, but also, oh, by the way, how do you think about it from your lens as a parent? Uh, same thing from the bad guy. Um, the bad guy in you know war games and and frankly you know a lot of bad fiction uh, is usually sort of you know um, tweaking at their mustache you know they're one dimensional okay if you look at it through a character you can say okay what's the motivations of it uh, and sometimes it might be kind of empathetic and that hits you harder um, but the other part of it is that we often forget in um, our depictions. Uh, in terms of our exercises and planning and budgeting, we forget lessons, one from science fiction and one from the realm of war. Science fiction is what Gibson said about the futures here, but it's unevenly distributed. And you can think about that of, you know, you might have certain technologies unevenly distributed, but we also think about it in terms of, um, you may have a future, we already have it right now, of AIs, real, um, you know, you noted like, uh, yes, you know, our TV smarter than what went to the moon. Oh, by the way, we haven't got rid of homelessness. We haven't got rid of um, government bureaucracy, different b agency buying habits. Um, yes, we've got, you know, much more data than ever before, but our databases don't talk to each other all that well. Um, and so, you know, we move that future forward a little bit. But we also bring all of the uneven distribution, whether it's socioeconomic or the like. Um, and then the other aspect is the lesson from Clausewitz. Uh, you know, so people who put on their war hats will know this. The idea that you have a fog of war, you have friction. Um, yes, these are your plans. It doesn't mean that your plans always work out the way that you want. And it might be a operational plan or it might be some cool new gadget or app that of course when you deploy it may not work out the way you plan or guess what people may not use it the same way that you want and so you know sort of a, a funny scene um early on that depicts this is we lay out uh all the different ways that are planned for um driverless cars uh and yet you know we it's going to be cool it's going to be great we can see you know all the wonderful applications from it but it doesn't mean that you don't have cybersecurity risks of um, fleets being hacked, uh, but not just stealing information, but creating kinetic change, sort of, you know, take Stuxnet and move it forward. It also means um, because they're in the hands of lots of different people and businesses that are competing, you're still going to have traffic. I hate to tell you, you know, Washington, D.C. of the future, you know, we will have more AI, we'll have Internet of Things, we'll have all this wonderful stuff, we'll still have traffic. Um, and so that's what we kind of depict in the in the world of burn-in. Uh, use that story as a way to instruct on it, um, and as well hitting you know larger dilemmas that we all have to figure out. So you referenced AI at a couple of points there, and I know AI is one of the central artificial intelligence themes of the book. Um, for the folks that you know, our audience, if you will, at the Global Cyber Alliance, a lot of them are interested in security and privacy more than anything else. Can you talk a little bit about how the book explores the implications of artificial intelligence for those two areas? Sure. So um, it hits a couple of uh, key themes as they apply to um, security. Uh, one is um, what does the world and the network look like as we shift from an internet that was based uh, about human communication. Uh, and then you literally go back to the original memo and the Pentagon in the 1960s described how, you know, what if we could turn computers into quote, communication devices. And that's been um, world changing, of course, but the internet is now in the midst of changing into about not people communicating back and forth, but things and things using it to operate. Um, and more importantly, things through the integration of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and the like, becoming um, intelligent things. So it's not just that your car, your home, your business, your government agency, from the overall agency down to the individual employee at the pointy end of the spear. It's not just that they're networked now, it's that they are now networked and the things that are out there are, are networked. And constantly gathering data that allows all sorts of new insights um it also means uh whole new questions of privacy again at a societal all the way down to an individual level um but as you integrate ai into that it allows you not just to um 
create life histories out of just, you know, I, I, I map your identity off of a face. You walk into a building, I can now pull up uh, everything from, you know, that you bought in the past to I can network it out to, you know, what your family members bought in the past. Um, but more importantly, it moves into prediction. Okay, now what are you going to do next based off of all of this data and us sifting through it? And even more so, influencing. How can I steer you to take a certain action? And it might be a certain action that is um, security related. Uh, it might be a, an information operation, uh, a foreign government. It might be a certain action that's um, for profit uh, oriented. So we've got that. We've got, you know, what does it truly mean to move into um, a panopticon made real? I mean, again, it's going to bring, you know, uh, all sorts of positives and negatives. Uh, and, um, oh, by the way, as an aside, everything that I just said has been massively accelerated by the coronavirus pandemic um, because that data that is being collected is now of an even greater scale because we're pulling in, we're planning to pull in health data. Um, also, it's being deployed out more widely than we than had been planned. Um, okay, so we've got this network, though. We're unfortunately making all of the mistakes that we made in security with the original internet about communication. We are not baking security in. Um, there's all sorts of data about that that you know you're familiar with and, and um, you know we've got the reports and it's both uh, about the communication itself. Um, one study found that uh, I believe the figure was 97% of all IOT communication is not encrypted. So it's gathering all of this data, whether it's your car, your home, the building, and it's communicating, it's not encrypted, but it also found that over 57% um, of the devices were vulnerable to um, uh, attacks that were uh, fairly catastrophic. And again, the attack is not just about stealing information or ransomware. We're gonna see ransomware start to hit more and more things um uh, again be it a house be it an industry be it a bus uh not to plot spoil um but it'll also be about creating kinetic change uh what if i could for example cause the device to think that it is physically located somewhere other than it is a gps hack i could then cause that car cause that drone to smash into something um even though it thinks it's doing the right thing. What I just said is not a what if, um, that is a real vulnerability that's out there. What if, for example, uh, someone did, uh, went after the um, chemical levels at water treatment plants. That is not a what if, uh, that is something that happened in Israel just a couple of weeks ago, uh, went after the um, chlorine levels in water treatment plants. And, and um, I don't wanna plot spoil too much here, but. Um, if you think that the um, small towns and small businesses that run water treatment facilities in the U.S., for example, you and I are, uh, live in Washington, D.C., upriver on the Potomac, if you think they have better cybersecurity than the Israeli government, I've got really bad news for you. Um, so you've got that aspect of it. Um, so we open up a world of um, new forms of attacks. But then the final thing that we open up is um, new attackers. Uh, with this change, we lower the barrier to entry to carrying out high-end attacks. Think about um, Stuxnet. Stuxnet, you know, was, for example, most people would argue the first true cyber weapon, and then it created physical change in the target. Stuxnet was um, almost like a, a cyber Manhattan project. It involved uh, some of the top experts, um, both in terms of different uh, layers, in terms of you know the attack itself, building that weapon, that piece of software it was really exquisite. But also, it involved um, multiple people outside the cybersecurity specialty, you know, spies and lawyers and the like. It brought together all of this expertise. You know, only truly could the U.S. have done that. Uh, you know, a little bit about a half decade back. Well, now that capability is pushed down and it might be a foreign state actor or it might just be again not to plot spoil a single individual who's decided that he wants to hold the city of washington dc hostage um, this is the world that we enter into but 
go back to the notion of nonfiction and fiction. We share all of this data, we share all of this information, but we do it through the story of the novel. The idea, though, is that it's um, not merely an act of prediction, but hopefully prevention. Um, that is, I, some, there's some parts I want to, you know, will come true, and it's going to be great to see them come true. Uh, a certain kind of toy that, that my kids might have that's already, at, you know, at, at, at patent stage. Um, but other parts are nightmare scenarios we don't want to come true. And so hopefully people reading it, it hits them in a way that they say, okay, what am I going to do to prevent that from happening? To prevent that from happening at a national level to, ooh, that might hit my enterprise. Okay, what are we doing to, to prevent that? Um, and that, again, uh, is the value of packaging it that way. It's um, The data shows that it's more likely to cause um, not just people to read, but it hits your brain in a very different way than, a, than an Excel spreadsheet or a PowerPoint or even a, a white paper would. I think that you make a very important point there, Peter. Um, you know, I think one of the things people think about when they think about the Internet of Things and some of these new capabilities is, you know, yes, this is going to be involved in government to government attacks, but how does this affect me? Um, I spent what, about two or three years ago, I think I wrote a blog I called Brick, which, among other things, mused that a, a future likely attack of ransomware is not going to be against encrypting data, but you know, it would be not really ransomware, but extortion. You know, you go to a consumer electronics company and you or a appliance company and say, by the way, you know, you need to pay me $10 million or I'm going to brick every refrigerator you've got deployed in the world. And we might and see and all that, that fluid is going to go bad. That uh, that's the sort yeah. of attack at scale that's readily possible. And, and it might be just like in cybersecurity, the old version, you know, it's funny to say that, but we've been at it, you know, a whole generation now, is you might see that um, high end uh, that's going for the single score, right? Going after the manufacturer uh, or, or the, the operator. If you don't do this, I'm going to hit everything in your fleet. But we will also see the, um, you know, so that's the spear phishing version of it, right? But we'll also see the low end parallel to phishing where uh, the score is not about trying to get the $10 million ransom, but to get a thousand people to give you the, the one Bitcoin version of it, right? And, and we've seen already test uh, versions of that where um, someone showed off that they could hold ransom a um, smart thermostat. Uh, so maybe they go after the power company or maybe they go after each homeowner saying uh give me one bitcoin and i'll i'll you know it's a summer day in washington dc i'll give it back to you um and uh again it's that it's new forms of threats new forms of attackers and we need to catch up to it because this is uh what looms again we we we, we see the technologies of course changing we see the um threatscape is changing unfortunately um they tend to move at exponentials and our response, whether it's the policy political response to um, organizations implementing change in their own security, you know, uh, it's going exponential and we're kind of going glacial. And so the, the delta between the two um, is, is getting bigger and bigger. Um, we're going to see a greater effect from that, though. Uh, we will look back with longing to the days of, um, oh, man, they, they, they took an email. Uh, or you know, lost credit card information. Um, this very much changes the impact. It changes how you think about insurance. You name it. Um, there's another part though about that delta that, that's really interesting to me is that um, it's the very topic of of IoT and AI. Um, every single organization out there, uh, whether it's um, the U.S. government, uh, the Chinese government, to you know, Fortune 500 companies, you name it. You go to their strategy papers and they say, this technology is the key to our future. Uh, for example, the U.S. National Defense Strategy talks about that. Or you, you, know, you want to look at um, companies, you know, not just tech companies, um, McDonald's, John Deere, they, they, they all talk about it. Um, a survey was taken of uh, political and business leaders and 91% um, of them in the survey said AI is, 
the, the game changing technology that matters the most. So we all say, this thing is huge, this isn't important. And yet, polling data shows um, they did a survey of leaders, and 17% of them self reported that they had a passing familiarity with AI, let alone all the implications that you and I talked about. And that's self reporting. You and I know that, you know, business execs and the like, you know, probably that 17% is in reality lower. That's still an amazing delta, right? 91% say this thing is huge and important, and 17% are saying, I have a familiarity with it. We've got to close that gap. And um, that's again, you know, there's lots of ways to go after it. Um, one, hopefully, is through an entertaining novel, get you started. So, thanks very much, Peter. Before we run out of time, I wanted to move a little bit from the physical space more to the information space and turn back to um, a book you wrote a couple of years ago called Like War. Um, now, everybody these days is thinking about disinformation and elections and all of that sort of activity, and, and they're right to be concerned about it. Um, obviously, there's nothing much more important in a free society than free and fair elections. But it seems to me that um, the effect we've got of social media and disinformation, you know, elections are really only the tip of the iceberg. They may be the most critical part, but they're only the tip of social changes. Um, what do you think in the information space and the, you know, the social media environment we've got, what does information warfare really mean? How is it different now? How has it become fundamental? Yeah, great question. And, and something I think that's been, unfortunately, graphically illustrated by the events of uh, the last several months. Um, so we've tended to think about um, digital threats uh, as um, the classic concept of cyber war, the um, hacking of networks themselves. And as you and I were talking about, uh, previously the hacking of networks was about stealing information. And it might be stealing intellectual property of uh, national security or corporate significance, or it might be low level stealing of credit card information or email or whatnot. Um, and then, but we're also seeing this change of, I get into the network and I cause physical effect, um, right? And that'll have greater power. But there is a parallel to it that's um, played out with the rise of social networks. And it's not about hacking the network, it's about hacking the people on the network. And, and we call this like war. It's the idea of um, an attack by driving ideas viral. And we've seen this activity, of course, you know, famously hit the, the US 2016 election. And um, since then, it's uh, hit over 30 other democracies' elections. And it's swinging back to hit the US one, um, but it's you know not a US phenomena. Um, but of course, it plays out in all sorts of other areas. Um, it's part of the story of uh, the rise of ISIS and um, extremism. Um, it's been woven into attacks on um, corporate actors, uh, for example, um, driving ideas viral to um, help affect their share price, uh, for example, um, sometimes to drive down share price. Um, it's also wrapped up into um, what's played out in the um, pandemic. Uh, public health professionals um, describe how dealing with the pandemic has been made more difficult because of the accompanying um, what they call infodemic. Um, this mass spread of misinformation and deliberate disinformation. Um, and unfortunately, it's become as the uh, bipartisan co-chairs of the Cyber Solarium Commission uh, described, um, they said that it's now a quote, life or death, quote, end quote, issue. Um, we have seen mis and disinformation, uh, to put it bluntly, it's cost thousands of lives in the United States. It um, affected the environment around um, both, it delayed an effective response early on, and now it's shaping and misshaping uh, responses in the policy spectrum. Uh, but it also, at an individual level, scaled out behavior that was dangerous, not just to that individual, but then, of course, virality, all the people around them. Um, and so it points to very much about how we need to get uh, a handle on, you know, just like 15 years ago, we had to start to uh, take seriously cyber threats. The same thing on the life war side. 
And just like in you know regular old cybersecurity, there's no one silver bullet to this. It has to involve um, rethinking government strategy and importantly, uh, across different agencies. This is not just an issue for um, DHS or intelligence community. There's, there's you know, elements that involve everything from uh, State Department to Department of Education. Um, there, in that government response, there is a lot for the U.S. to learn from other nations, uh, the Estonias, um, even uh, to the north, the Canada's, that have done a better job at this in a policy spectrum, you know, protected their democracy, still free states, but built up resilience. Um, but given all that, yes, role for government doesn't mean there's not a role for private sector uh, to do a better job at this. And, you know, there's a lot that can be done there. And then finally, there's the role of individuals. You know, just like in um, regular cybersecurity, no one said, ah, man, um, we created cyber command. I, I guess I don't need good passwords now. Um, same thing in public health. You know, no one said, um, or no one should be saying, well, um, they, they're, they're working, government invested to work on um, a vaccine. I guess I can, you know, uh, not cover my mouth when I cough and I don't have to wash my hands anymore. Um, now, a lot of people are being told that uh, misinformation wise, but again, there's an individual responsibility when it comes to um, online behavior too. And so you want each of these three elements acting and doing a better job at risk management. And um, unfortunately in the US, uh, we are the nation that um, invented the internet and we are the nation that is um, you know, the model for how to get your butts kicked by the internet uh, right now when it comes to online mis and disinformation. And oh, by the way, we're our own worst enemy. And so we, we, we have to do a better job of this, both to better protect our democracy, but also better protect businesses, better protect our families and our kids. So let me kind of bring these two topics together because we've focused a lot on um, nation state and other disruptive activity. Um, so one of the things I'm thinking about is there's an analogy that's become common out there is referring to cyberspace as the fifth domain. So there were the four traditional domains of door warfare, land, water, air, and then space. And now cyber in the view of DOD may be the fifth domain. And two friends of mine, um, Dick Clark and Rob Kanaki wrote a book called The Fifth Domain. Um, so I have some thoughts about that analogy, but I'm curious as to if you have any opinions about it and whether it's well taken or not. Um, so I think there's some parts where I'm, I'm totally on board and other parts where I, I might not be fully on the train. Um, I'm on board with uh, the effort and, and look, you know, they, they've been some of the leading voices in bringing greater attention to it and the argument that you um, need to uh, start to task out responsibility for it and, and treat it like a domain. I mean, I find it, hilarious that we have a um, uh, the concept of a, of a space force as a service and you know if you were going to create a new one cyber would have made a lot more sense um, because it truly is uh, it's far more um, uh, where you need a different kind of service identity and background and training and all that goes into it but you know set that aside um, where I may not be fully on board is that um, this is a space that uh, has to involve multiple different agencies. Uh, you can never have kind of one entity. Uh, and, and I think they, they get that and they argue that, but sometimes it's, it's misinterpreted that, you know, I can just hand this off to someone. And they, we see that, for example, not just on cyber threat side, but on the, the information disinformation side. Uh, you know, again, you need activity, yes, from um, intelligence community, but you at the other end of the spectrum need activity from Department of Education. That is completely not caught up U.S. education for the new need for digital literacy and in the way that we've seen other nations, the Estonias, the Israels, uh, et cetera, you know, help better defend their nation that way. Um, the other part is um, by framing it as a domain, we fall into military uh, kind of, you know, thoughts and identities. And um, this is something that uh, General Hayden's been um, very eloquent on, is that the roles are reversed in this space. Um, in this situation, uh, government 
is the, um, for the most part, the supporting organization rather than initially the organization on the front of the battlefield. Um, and so it is the one that is in a supporting role most often to private sector. Um, and other times it's, in a, it's a regulator of private sector, but we can't sort of say, okay, this is a domain that's handed off to just military side. Um, so I think that's uh, you know kind of where I'm with it, where I'm, I'm slightly different from it. Um, one aspect that's also important to note about this um, is that typically when we put it in these kind of domains, again, by falling into a, a military framework, we look for like actors to face off against. So Space Command, sorry, Space Force um, was created because Chinese government and Russia are doing more there. But um, in this space, we have a mix of threat actors. Um, and uh, that will only continue to grow. Um, and it's both state um, and you know the, the Russias, the Chinas, the Irans, uh, the, the frenemies. We've seen some really interesting things coming out of, uh, for example, the Gulf states that have actually you know, targeted sometimes entities in the US, um, private citizens and the like. Uh, but um, you also have a wide array of non-state actors and um, they're, they might be across the ideological spectrum. And that's one of the things that we've seen both on the cyber side, but also increasingly on the life war side and elevated by all of the forces that we've talked about in burn-in of AI and IoT is you see um, what you call strange coalitions you see groups that um, may not have the same ideology. In fact, they may have completely opposite ideologies. Far right, far left, anti-vaxxer vegans, neo-Nazis, Russian information warriors, and yet they end up not operating always in coordination, but in cohesion to the same effect and um, that is a big change that we have to, uh, again, understand and it matters politically, it matters you're running a business and looking at the threats coming at you. Thanks, Peter, that's great. The, uh, on, the, on the military versus civilian discussion, um, if, for people listening, uh, there's a really interesting opinion piece written by Jane Holute and Bruce McConnell about a decade ago that got published in Wired on whether uh, cyberspace is a military or a civilian space, arguing that it is and should be a civilian space. So folks might want to take a look at that. Um, I'd like to close with I mean, one it's, last it's, question. It's literally owned and operated by, it's not just that civilians fill it, it's, it's literally owned and operated by um, civilian companies. Uh, so, we, you know, that's the reality of it. So um, I'll close with this. Uh, I cut my teeth in cyber about 25 years ago when I was one of the original cyber prosecutors at the U.S. Department of Justice. So there were, I was the number six prosecutor. Um, and one of the things that we used to talk a lot about when we were educating, when we were doing our work and educating other prosecutors is how um, online things are different, right? Because, um, because it's a world of code. Um, and it's a world of information, and that means that the crime scene itself is malleable and under the control of the criminal. Um, so you know, the logs, the fingerprints, the digital fingerprints online could be subject to manipulation. Not that you can't do that in the physical world, but it's much easier to do online. Um, as the last 25 years have gone by, it seems to me that that problem has become, I mean, <laughs> it's become on steroids. So you know, it's not just the immediate evidence, but the broader political context, the opinions of people. I mean, the, the base facts on which people are making decisions are now no longer, I should say they're no longer subject to, um, to intellectual and factual debate, but they're up for debate. You know, that um, we don't, we've lost the foundations of trust. We've lost the ability to argue from a common factual predicate. Um, and I think that's a general concern we've got. My, my question is, if you agree with that, and you may not, but if that's a problem, what's the path forward to survival for liberal democracies, if you will, where the foundations of trust 
maybe I shouldn't say they no longer exist, but they've been, you know, th their foundations are being washed out. You know, the hurricanes come in and the 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 pier that goes out into the ocean is teetering. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, great question and hits so many different issues. Um, I'll, I'll frame it this way. Uh, Burnin is, you know, like I said, it's it's a it's a novel, uh, but it's baking in nonfiction. Uh, but the important thing that, um, and it's strange to say this about a novel as opposed to a white paper, is novel should always evoke certain underlying themes, right? Um, you know, Moby Dick is not actually uh, about a hunt for a whale. You know, it is, but there's a larger theme out of it. Um, and uh, for us, a key theme is um, that important word that you, you put out there, trust. And um, trust has actually two different definitions. Um, there's the way that we usually communicate and think about trust. You know, I, I like, I trust you, I believe you. Um, but there is a second, which is the engineering version of trust, which is just basically you or that, that object operate in the expected manner. So for example, I can trust that someone is a liar and then navigate the world in an effective way. I can trust that they will always lie and then I'll be able to navigate the world effectively. So I may not trust them in the first term, but I can I know the way that they're going to operate, right? And so the, these two different definitions of trust are not just fraying in America right now, but they are directly under siege by all of these different actors that we've talked about. Um, and so the cyber threats that matter in the future really are going after both types of systems of trust. They're going after the, um, uh, do I believe? Uh, what are the, what do I believe? What do I know? Um, and uh, that worldview uh, and making institutions and organizations untrustworthy uh, in the eyes of those who depend on them. And then that can be exploited to real effect, right? You know, whether it's to, to harm an election, whether it's to manipulate someone to buy something, um, to even cause them to do dangerous things for public health. But then there's the other type of trust that we're going after, which is making the infrastructure of the world not work in an expected manner, right? I, I, my attack on IoT is to, is to undermine the way that it operates, the way that either it sees the world or, and, and doesn't operate as planned or in turn to, to affect certain action. And so we have to reframe our um, thinking uh, around how to defend um, trust. Uh, and um, that, you know, ranges from um, building up a new vocabulary for it. Uh, we have to understand, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, catching policymakers up for, you know, here's what's playing out with IoT to um, algorithmic bias issues. You've got to understand that. Um, you know, again, you and I may have, and, and everyone has had, have good arguments about certain policies, but the dilemmas themselves, we, we, we have to solve. We can agree on the problem set. Um, and so maybe getting the vocabulary right. Uh, more broadly, in my mind, it's, um, and I think it's very appropriate to, to pandemic uh, world that we're in, is that um, the key issue moving forward for the United States is resilience. Um, we look at too many problems through the lens of deterrence. How do I make the bad guy too scared to attack me? When the reality is that there's a multiplicity of bad guys, um, some, some are human, some are, are threats uh, that are digital, climate change, pandemic, um, many of that, that panoply of threats means that um, many of them are not deterrable. Uh, again, whether it's because there are governments who've figured out how to game the system or they're a threat you can't just scare away. And so instead, in the 21st century moving forward, resilience is the real game that matters. How do I, um, I should expect the bad day to come how do I make sure that bad day is um, not a worst case scenario? How do I shrug off the attack or how do I recover quickly? And that again is um, a very different mindset, whether you're thinking about overall cybersecurity strategy for a nation or you're thinking about it for your own individual networks. 
but you know, to, to build up resilience to circle back, you can't build up resilience if you don't even understand the threats that are coming, if you don't have the basic vocabulary for it, if you haven't visualized what that world um, might look like. Uh, and you know, so hopefully we can offer a little bit of uh, value in that. And the other thing is uh, give people an escapist read at a time they need it. Um, I'll plot spoil, there, there's no pandemic in, in, in Burnin. Uh, so you can, you can enjoy it that way too. And that's why I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and um, uh, the audience about it. Peter, thanks so very much. It's always fascinating to hear you talk your, and I say this without, um, without trying um, to be um, unduly uh, favorable, but you're one of my favorite speakers um, because when I hear you talk, I always walk away smarter. Um, and so thank you very much for spending some time with us today. And um, I hope you all enjoyed the conversation with Peter as much as I did. Thanks thank very you. much.